So, where do we start? Well, any good story starts with you. So, I want you to think about yourself. And then now I want you to think about what things are most important to you in your world. And normally we think of big things as being important. If an elephant shows up in your room, you notice it. If a cockroach shows up, not so much. Okay? We're used to thinking about big things. But the great technological lesson of the last 50 years is that big is out and small is in. So small is big and big is small. That's been the lesson of the last 50 years in terms of technology. And it's kind of amazing because if you go back and read the science fiction of the time, for example, you don't find them talking a lot about uh, microcomputers and things like that. You, they're thinking about going to space and what have you. We have a natural prejudice for the big, but in fact, the small has provided more revolutions in the last uh, few decades than the big by far. And in particular, there are two nanotechnologies out there that have affected all of our lives. So microelectronics that now dominates and completely controls our lives. We all walk around glued to our iPhones 24-7, uh, sleep when we have to, but otherwise we're, we're engaged in one way or another. Uh, this nanotechnology has really, in a sort of almost in a parasitic way, taken over a large part of our lives. And it's been incredibly powerful. And the only one more powerful is the nanotechnology that is us. Uh, life itself is constructed out of machines at the nanoscale that assemble into complex structures that do uh, all the wonderful things that we do. And furthermore, while the manufacturing technology, for example, for an integrated circuit requires billions of dollars to build a fab line, the, the fabrication technology for life involves throwing out a few seeds into the dirt, letting the rain come, and watching it grow. So this is pretty impressive, but this technology really blows us away. Now, my own work lives at the border between these two nanotechnologies in carbon-based materials like carbon nanotubes and graphene sheets, where uh, we try to bridge the gap between these two nanoscale worlds. But I'm actually not going to talk to you about my own work today. I talked about that this morning. Um, I'm instead going to talk to you, take a zoom back out and talk to you just as one citizen to another discussing the implications of nanotechnology on our lives. So, at this point, you should be getting nervous. Uh, why should you be getting nervous? Uh, you should be getting nervous because I'm a physicist and I'm talking to you about technology. Okay. Now, uh, I, I do have engineering degrees, but come on. I'm, in, in truth, I'm a physicist. I, I don't think I've ever done anything useful in my life um, technologically. Um, so, in, so, why should you be worried? Why should you be worried about having a physicist tell you about technology? Well, let's view technology as a cow, okay? You live in Ithaca, New York, you start to think of lots of things as cows. We have lots of cows in Ithaca. Well, you know how a physicist views a cow. Um, there's what a physicist thinks of a cow. Take away everything that's inessential about it and, think, and leave behind the true essence of cow. And apparently it's that it's spherical, it has spots, and it goes moo. Seems to be the main dominant thing. But it's worse than that. A physicist, when confronted with something wonderful like this, will not only wildly oversimplify it, will then try to do the stupidest, weirdest, strangest thing that you can imagine with that cow. And I will quote the, the famous philosopher Dave Barry, who said, scientists tell us that the fastest animal on Earth with a top speed of 120 feet per second is a cow that has been dropped out of a helicopter. <laughs> So if that sounds like fun, taking something wonderful like that and dropping it out of a helicopter, then you might be a physicist. Okay, so just a little test for you. Okay. But you're stuck here. I'm a physicist, and I'm going to talk to you about technology, so, so deal with it. Um, but one of the implications of this is I'm going to talk in the most general terms. We're not going to get lost in details. We're going to try to keep the big picture in mind. So what are we going to talk about today? So I'm going to do three things. First, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how small is small in the world of electronics, how small our nanotechnologies have gotten, try to get a handle on that. Um, then I'll discuss a little bit about how we as a society might go about building a nanotech that wasn't just electronic but physical. And finally, I'll do a particular uh, combination of nanotechnologies and see who's going to be better for a particular application, energy, whether we're going to use in the future chips or bugs to make our, 
our energy. So that's the outline of the talk. Um, let's start with number one, which is how small is small. And I bring this up because it's really hard to grasp just how crazy small small is now in a modern, say, integrated circuit, and where the power in that lies. So um, it's hard for us to think about small, as I mentioned, but it's not so hard for us to think about big. So let's take something big. Well, the planet is big. Um, how big is the planet? It's about uh, 10 million meters in size, 10 to the 7 meters in size. In fact, that was the original definition of the meter. If you started at the equator and you walked up to the North Pole, that would be 10 to the 7 meters. Um, not the most precise version, but that gives you a sense. So whenever you're trying to remember how big the Earth is, that's how big it is. Now, how big are we? Um, I've taken Pee Wee Herman as our representative human here. Uh, Pee Wee Herman's about a meter in size, roughly speaking. Okay. So going from the planet to Pee Wee Herman is a ratio of about 10 to the minus 7. Okay? The planet is 10 to the 7 times bigger than you are. So that gives you a sense of scale. That's from a small to a big. Let's go the other way. <clears throat> Let's take a modern silicon wafer. It might be almost a meter in size. That'd be about the size of, about the size of you, a meter in size. Now let's zoom in on some of the smallest features in here. They might be about 100 nanometers in size. Honestly, these days, more like 30 nanometers in size. So what's the ratio of those two numbers? It's that same ratio, 10 to the minus 7. So think about that for a second. That means on this wafer that was made by Intel, there is detail that is equivalent to the detail of the entire surface of the planet rendered at the scale of the, of the individual human being. That's how much stuff is written on the scale of that, uh, of that wafer. That's how much complexity is there. And for example, if you snapped off one of these for a given integrated circuit that might live inside of your computer, that's like if you took us like Manhattan, okay? So inside of your computer is the complexity of Manhattan uh, represented down to the scale of an individual human. Okay? Amazing amount of stuff in there. Now that's amazing, but there's a bigger one that's even more crazy. So uh, let's think about time, not space. So Pee Wee Herman thinks thoughts about once every second. Well, actually, maybe we don't really want to think about what Pee Wee Herman is thinking about. Let's try, let's try somebody else. Albert Einstein thinks about one thought per second. This is one of my favorite quotes. Things should be as simple as possible, but not any simpler. That's our goal here today. So he has that thought in one second, another thought in the next second, etc. So how many thoughts does Albert Einstein have in a lifetime? Well, you just do the math, take it, sum it up, 3,600 seconds in an hour, 24 hours, 365 days, 70 years, and we'll divide by two to let him sleep a little bit, and to let him daydream and not think at all just a little bit. The number that turns out to come from that is about 10 to the 9, 1 billion. That's what you've got in your life. You've got about a billion seconds, a billion thoughts to have in your life. What about your computer? How fast does your computer make, have thoughts? It's not quite the right thing, but how fast does it process information? Someone, everyone under the age of 30 probably knows the answer to this. So it's like a gigahertz, something like that, your processor speed. So that's 10 to the 9. So guess what? Your computer in one second has about 10 to the 9 operations. Now, it's not quite as complicated as a thought, but you get the idea. Um, it's doing stuff so fast in time that a whole lifetime occurs in every second. So think about it. Inside of your computer, you basically have a large city where every second is like a whole lifetime of the inhabitants of the city, all sitting inside your computer going, all miniaturized down to something so small that it's just barely a postage stamp in size. It kind of makes you wonder what's happening when your computer's booting up, right? Generations are living and dying inside of your computer uh, while the thing is just starting to start up. But it gives you a sense of why small is big. 
Because for something like information processing, where the scale of the object being processed does not matter, you don't care how big your one and zero is, the smaller you make it, the more stuff you can pack into a given size and the more uh, stuff you can get in a given space. So that gives you a sense of how small small is. So that's pretty cool, right? So we should be justifiably very proud of our technologies that give us this kind of spatial complexity and allow us to, to think and or transfer information at these kind of data rates. That's why the world has gotten so strange. That's because of that ability. But before we get too carried away, let's think a little bit about the technology of life. So what does that look like? And to do that, I'm going to show you a, a, an animation by a guy who I met recently. He's a very nice guy who uh, tries to take modern scientific advances and render them as realistic animations. So this is an animation. It's an artist creation, but it tries to be at least somewhat true to fact. So, so that's, that's what a real nanotechnology looks like. And I, I have to say, <clears throat> if you are a professional scientist who claims to be a nanoscientist or a nanotechnologist, and you watch something like that and realize that's really what's going on inside of you all the time, it's just terrifying about, it makes you feel so inadequate, you know. You're just, you just kind of want to go crawl in a corner and go to sleep for about a week because it's so amazing what happens inside of you uh, and how effectively it works. And the scale of it so blows away, for example, what we can do in electronics. 
So that 100 nanometer size scale I told you about for electronics, a virus can be about 100 nanometers in size. It will have 10 to the fifth bits of information stored inside of it in, in the form of a DNA. And furthermore, that program knows how to kill you. Okay. So life still beats electronics. So, but that brings up a question. You know, we've built a nanotechnology that manipulates information. Can we build a nanotechnology that manipulates the physical world, makes molecules move around, makes stuff happen the way life does, for example? Is that possible? And about 50 years ago, in fact, Richard Feynman made a famous speech called There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom, where he presented this challenge to scientists. He said, you know, we should just make machines really small. Wouldn't that be cool? He got it. He understood what that would mean. And in a certain sense, we've spent the last 50 years doing that in the realm of electronics. We've made a nanotech that shuffles around electrons in ways that are much like the challenge that Feynman presented. Having said that, in the world of physical nanotechnology, we're still in the dark ages. We can't make small-scale machines that can do the kinds of things that you would like to do. And in fact, I think that's a, actually a, another 50-year challenge for the next 50 years. So if you're a, an undergraduate or a graduate student today, by the time you're retiring, um, assuming the robots haven't killed us um, and or they haven't made drugs to make us live forever so you have to work forever, um, I think that's about the time when we will start to have a physical nanotech that has the kind of sophistication you see in electronic nanotech now. It's very hard to know what that will mean, what the implications of that will be, but it doesn't, uh, uh, it, it, it's gonna be weird. <laughs> you think electronics has changed our society in lots of ways, you wait until this stuff hits. It's gonna be very, very strange. Um, who knows what it will look like? You can go online and type in nanotech and pictures will pop up. And they usually look like little machines that come from our world that are down there grabbing a hold of viruses or something like that. It probably won't look anything like that. It'll probably look completely different. It'll look like something that we're not expecting. It won't just be smaller versions of what we have. But I think if I were starting out a career right now, I think that would be an awfully interesting thing to do, is to try to figure out how to discover uh, the rules and laws for making a, a truly nanoscale technology. But if we want to do it faster, nobody wants to wait 50 years. If we want to get there faster, what do we do? How do we get there? Is there some, can we cheat? Can we do something different? Can we get there quicker? And I'll say a few words about that. So the first way to get there quicker is to, is to, to go into the realm of fiction. Okay, you can just make stuff up and uh, prognosticate about what's going to happen. How many of you have read uh, Prey by Michael Crichton? A few of you. Um, by the way, he has a new, he, believe it or not, even though he's been dead for three years, he's got a new book coming out next month, uh, which is another, it's called Micro, which is another sort of nanoscience thriller. So if you like that sort of thing, uh, get ready. But I remember I read this book a while back. I read it and I said, oh yeah, that was, that was pretty interesting, but he got a lot of stuff wrong. And I said, you know, I, I think I could write a book like that. I think I could write a book like a, like, like Prey. Be very nervous when you have those kinds of thoughts. They can uh, lead to many, many years spent of effort. And in fact, reading Prey and thinking I could write a book like that is what got me started to the idea of writing a novel. Um, and people always ask, well, why would you go off and write a novel? Um, I think basically I was having my midlife crisis. I was about 40. And uh, you hit 40 and you, you, know, you sort of know how science works and you kind of know how your, your job behaves and you want some, some kind of change. And so what do you do? Well, you can, you know, you can divorce your wife, but I actually love my wife. Um, you can um, buy a sports car, a red sports car with a, you know, soft top. I don't really like sports cars. And if you're an academic, you can also become a dean. That's the other thing that's open to you. <laughs> How many deans are here? Yeah. Should, should you become a dean? And <laughs> the answer is no. Yeah. So, all right, what's left? All right, I'll write a thriller novel. That's my last choice for a... But I think it was an opportunity for me to start reading again. It's now part of my job description to read thrillers. I'm working when I'm reading a thriller. That's what I tell my wife. Are we okay now? 
We have volume? We good? Yeah. Done something funny. Okay. So I thought, well, maybe I can write a thriller. So we're going to take a little detour away from our main scientific story here. And I'm going to tell you a few things about, about my experiences of writing, uh, writing a novel. And I didn't come to this with any background. I'd never written a novel before. I hadn't written fiction since I was a, probably since I was at OU. Uh, so how did that happen? Um, well, it's interesting. The first thing I'd say is that it turns out at Cornell, it's something about Cornell, because there's a history of nerds writing fiction at Cornell. It keeps happening. And here's some of the more famous nerds to write fiction at Cornell. Um, who's this guy? Anybody? Kurt Vonnegut. So this is Kurt Vonnegut, probably the most famous nerd writer from, from Cornell. He was an engineering undergrad and started writing before the military then took him away, so he didn't finish at Cornell, but he was an undergrad there. Uh, this one, this one's a little, this one, we'll do this one, this is easy. Carl Sagan, professor at Cornell, uh, also wrote a, a lot of nonfiction, but also a novel, um, Contact, which went, went on to star Jodie Foster in the movie. Um, this one, this one's a little harder, anybody? It's a butterfly, that's a key. His scientific bit was he was into butterflies. Anybody? This shows that you need a better liberal arts education in with your engineering, yeah. Uh, so this is Vladimir Nabokov, who wrote Lolita while uh, uh, living in Ithaca, and uh, work, and, but he's also a sort of a butterfly, was a butterfly nut. And this is probably the hardest one, anybody there? The hint there is there's only really bad pictures of him. Uh, it's Thomas Pynchon, a very famous novelist who doesn't like his picture taken, so this is the only good picture of him. He was also an engineering undergrad at Cornell. So there's something, that, you know, there's something about Ithaca. It's probably the, the long winters and not much else to do, but people start writing. And that continues. I should say that when my book came out in March, that within a couple of months, there were at least five other debut novels in hardback coming out uh, from, pe from writers in Ithaca. Now, Ithaca, now, Norman makes Ithaca look like a giant, makes Ithaca, well, Ithaca is much smaller than Norman, let me put it that way. It's a town of, you know, 50, 30, 40,000 people, and yet we had six novels coming out with, debut novels within a few months of each other. At the, you, there would be lists that would come out that would have, you know, new novels, and there would be two from Ithaca, one from New York City, one from L.A. Uh, it's crazy. And in fact, this one, The Tiger's Wife, was just nominated, one of five books just nominated for the National Book Award. By, for its 25-year-old author, Taya Obrecht. Um, so, you know, there's something, if you want to write, maybe you should come to grad school at Ithaca because there's something in the water that, that makes writing happen. And it's really great because it means that there was a lot of, when I was starting to think about writing, there was a lot of support for the idea. A lot of people, you know, had wanted to write a book or had tried or what have you. And my uh, university also was very supportive. I was never scolded for taking this incredible right turn and trying to do something silly. Now, an interesting thing happened. Once I started to get into it, once I started to look into it, I found that actually writing was not so different than science in many ways. So let me show you. This is a picture taken out of a book called Story by Robert McKee, which is about screenwriting, but it's also a really great book for, for the, the novelist. And you look and there's a picture and there's some squiggly lines and there's plus charges and minus charges and there's little bubble diagrams that are interfering and doing something over here. It looks like physics, right? There's a Feynman diagram. It looks like a Feynman diagram, right? Doesn't it? Um, the only reason you know it's not is because there, it's your conscious desire that's interfering with your unconscious desire to create an object of desire, etc. But there is actual logic to storytelling that as a scientist you can really have a fun, or an engineer, you can have a fun time engaging with and starting to learn. And it sort of deepens and, and ripens your experience of reading stories. So I found it really fun. Um, for example, if you go to Google and you type in um, plays, they'll have a, you know, an entry on plays and they'll tell you the different kinds of plays. And they'll say there's a one-act play, there's a three-act play, and there's a five-act play. But there's no entry for two-act plays or four-act plays. So isn't that weird? Plays come in odd numbers. That turns out that that's not always true, but it's often true. Why would a play 
come in odd numbers of acts. Plays your fermions or something. I don't know. What is the deal here? Um, it's a very strange thing. Anybody know? That's, so I was really baffled. Well, let me show you. So here is, here is a play, a dramatic story, represented in a form that any scientist or engineer could love. So this is time going that way. Up is good, down is bad. End of story. So what happens in this particular story is things are pretty good, then they got bad, then they got good again, and then they got bad, ended badly. That's a story. Uh, what is not so much of a story is things were good, then they got bad, and then they got good again. You, you can almost feel the hesitation, like, wait, something else has to happen. You can't just, well, things were good, and then they got bad, and now they're good. What a boring, stupid story. You know? And the reason is nothing happened in that story. Things were good, then they got bad, then they got good. Big friggin' deal. Nothing happened. We read stories to see change. How do we avoid bad things? How do we find good things? So you've got to have an odd number so that you end up in a different place than you started. Uh, by the way, this gives you some rules. If you like happy endings, do not start with a book where the person is happy and has great children and a wonderful job. Uh, that person is going to be a drunk or dead or something by the end of the book. Okay? <laughs> if you like happy endings, start with a character who's on skid row already and whose wife has left them, etc. That person's going to end up, you know, winning on Dancing with the Stars or something like that. <laughs> So this is a drama. This is a drama story represented in, in this simple form. But I was writing thrillers. Thrillers are a little different. So here's a thriller. So that's a thriller. And you, and you immediately get it, right? You know, things are things were pretty good, right? Okay? And then things got bad. When you tried to drag yourself out of the bad, and then things got worse. And then you tried to drag yourself out of that, and they got worse. And then they got so bad, and right before it was all about to be a disaster, you managed to get back to okay and oh, life is good. So that's a thriller. And notice this violates the rule. You sort of end up where you started, but things were so friggin' bad. You're just thrilled to be back to where you started. You're so happy to have made it back to where you were. So that's a thriller. Of course, unless it's an apocalyptic thriller, in which case <laughs> things don't get better. You know, you have to walk the earth and eat your, you know, friend or something. I don't know. Um, so you'll have to read my book to the end to decide whether I wrote a thriller or apocalyptic thriller. This is the thing that the other thing you want is you don't have to you don't want to know the ending. And so you, we, we need to have at least two possibilities. So thriller or apocalyptic thriller. I'll leave that up to you. So that was the first thing that I found that was really amazing about writing a book was that there were rules that you could follow to a certain extent. They weren't rules like science rules but they were guidelines, shall we say, more like engineering design principles that would guide you. You could break them, but you better have a good reason for doing so. So uh, I'll, with that, I'll just say you can go read the book if you like. Uh, this is Ralphie reading Spiral. Ralphie's the dog of the screenwriter who wrote the screenplay for the book. Um, but the other thing I want to do at this point was say that this was a very long process, seven-year process, during which I was neglecting my scientific duties I was not writing as many grants. I shrank my group. I was destroying my scientific career to try to write this novel. And it took uh, 15 versions and, and seven years to do it. And for most of that time, I didn't have an agent. I didn't have a publisher. I didn't have anything. And amazingly enough, even though I was self-destructing, that whole time for this ridiculous dream, uh, the important people in my life stood behind me the, the whole way. Uh, for example, there's my mom who's down there at the book release. My dad holding up the Alaska pipeline here, as you see. Uh, here's my wife on version 6.6 six, six telling me what I did wrong here. That's Susan. And my in-laws. And they were all so fantastically supportive. And so I wanted everybody, if you don't mind, to give a big round of applause to my parents for being there. It, it, really, it really was stunning how wonderfully supportive they were. Okay, so let's get back to our story. We're back to trying to create a physical nanotechnology. So how are you going to do that? It's not so easy, um, as I mentioned, and you may not want to wait 50 years. But there is one approach that I can think of that will get you there quicker, and that's a real honest cheat, and that's to hack life. So don't build one, steal one. 
take the existing nanotech out there, namely biology, and learn how to program in its language and take control of its machinery and do it that way. And that's actually the main effort that's happening now, in a certain sense, in do building a physical nanotech. We're hacking life. And there are two versions of this, both of them pretty bizarre and sort of terrifying in many ways. It's great if you're a thriller writer. The first is to literally hack a bug, you know, to take a moth and implant a silicon chip in it and be able to put, give it electrical signals that control its wing and control its flight. And there are groups in, around the country, including at Cornell, who are doing exactly this. There's the nano version of this, which is the field of synthetic biology. You learn to program uh, DNA strands to be what you want, shove them in an organism and have it do what you want it to do and not what it wants to do. And that's the one we're actually going to talk about a little bit more here, hacking life. The idea is, is fairly straightforward. Um, <clears throat> the way things work now is there's some bacterium or some sort of thing, and uh, the DNA carries the physical information that gives the blueprint for making the next generation, and furthermore, uh, you get two instead of one, and so it grows. Okay? Pretty straightforward. Um, it's a heck of a manufacturing technology. And let me make that clear. A bacteria, say, might divide every 20 minutes. So you start with one cell. 20 minutes later, you've got two. 40 minutes, you've got four. Five hours later, you have 32,000. Seven hours later, you've got a million. 36 hours later, you've got a foot of bacteria covering the entire surface of the planet, if it could keep going like that. You need a lot of sugar and a lot of uh, uh, media. But uh, you get the idea that this kind of doubling manufacturing technology is extraordinarily powerful if you can harness it. So the idea is to interrupt that uh, transfer of DNA from one generation to the next, sequence the DNA, change it, put in a new DNA, and end up with a different organism. That's the basic uh, idea behind the field of synthetic biology. It's genetic engineering on steroids, or... Maybe a better way of saying it is it's turning genetic engineering into an engineering discipline where you have design principles that tell you how to get what you want at the output. Um, there is technology that's needed to make that happen. You need to be able to read DNA very effectively and synthesize it. And I should mention that there are remarkable advances being made that allow that to happen. Um, borrowing, for example, the machinery of, of biology again, RNA polymerase that knows how to read a DNA strand and listen, to that, listen in on that with nanotechnology doodads that allow us to see individual fluorescent events when um, individual uh, base pairs get replicated. Uh, for example, there's a company called Pacific Bi Biosciences that came out of Cornell that's trying to commercialize this technology. But one way or the other, we're on our way to the, we're in fact almost there at the $100 genome. Uh, now it's probably more like the $10,000 genome or it's probably even less than that now. But in a, just a few more years, it will be not cost prohibitive for you to have your entire genome sequenced, or at least your exon, at least your, your exome, I should say, at least your coding part of your uh, genome. That's just here. It's coming. You know, it's, it's, it's not even uh, part of the, it's, it's just here. You can also do other crazy things with DNA. For example, people have designed DNA strands that fold themselves up into cool shapes that are not biologically relevant, but are really fun. You can make, for example, happy faces uh, out of DNA. And when you do this, you get not one, you get jillions of them all in a, in a beaker. In fact, someone said it was, when they first did that, they had the most concentrated solution of happiness ever created. So, so that's pretty cool. Um, see, you're getting the idea that we're starting to hijack lives to do things that we find interesting. Um, and, and the extreme of that, which is basically where Craig Venter and company are with Cynthia is you start with information. You sit at your computer and you design a DNA sequence and you push a button and it spews it out. You shove it into a cell and it starts expressing itself. So you don't even bother with, you know, tinkering with a genome that previously existed. It starts out in software before being dumped into the hardware. And we're right, this, we're right there at that point now. That's where things are at more or less right now. So it's pretty wild. Now, what are you going to do with this? Well, I don't know. It's hard to guess. But, you know, just what, what you hear about, for example, is people may want to make biofuels with it, make algae whose job it is to make fuels for us. 
Um, even more likely to be useful in the near term is to make drugs in a cheap way. Uh, for example, Jay Kiesling at Lawrence Berkeley National Labs has a lot of money from the Gates Foundation to work on teaching uh, bacteria to make an anti-malarial drug, artemisinin, which is too expensive in its current manufacturing technology to be used in the third world, but their idea is to bring that cost way down and as a result save um, uh, thousands or millions of lives. So there are a lot of things that might be really wonderful out of this technology. And sort of like the early days of silicon, there's a whole food chain of companies that are building up in order to make this reality happen, to turn synthetic biology into the kind of industry that the semiconductor industry is now. All the way up from people doing machines to feed the industry, like the Pacific Biosciences, all the way up to the big chemical companies who have particular applications that they want to see addressed. And in fact, Craig Venter, who's maybe the, the most well-known proponent of synthetic biology, said that over the next 20 years, synthetic genomics is going to become the standard for making anything, which sounds a bit grandiose, but Craig is a bit of a grandiose guy. Uh, having said that, you know, it, it's, it's possible that we will make a lot of things this way in the future instead of the way we make them now. And of course, the question is, you know, <laughs> sounds great. What could possibly go wrong? You know, how could this go bad? Um, I'm sure it's all just going to be wonderful. Of course, that's not true. And just to, to be unpleasant for a moment, World War I um, killed 16 million people with our big machines that we invented during that time. About the same time, the influenza, a really nasty influenza hit that killed five times that number, something like that, in a time scale of, of about one-fourth of the time period. Um, killed anywhere between 50 and 100 million people worldwide. Incredibly dangerous stuff. Uh, and so synthetic biology, we, you know, there's obviously a huge concern that it will be used for bad ends, either accidentally or on purpose. And so that's, you know, that's not a lot of fun. Uh, but that's the way things are. Um, uh, synthetic biology has potential huge benefits, but also enormous risks. And I don't know what to do about that other than to, than to say it's true. Um, and, you know, the, it's very hard when you develop a new technology that is wonderful as, uh, or as powerful as something like synthetic biology to know the outcome. And um, to make that point, we'll return to our technology as a cow. Um, and I will quote the famous philosopher Calvin of Calvin and Hobbes, who said, who was the first guy that looked at a cow and said, I think that I'll drink whatever comes out of that when I squeeze it. Yeah, I like that one, too. Yeah. <coughs> so you never know. All right, so we'll squeeze the cow. We'll see what comes out. Um, but the last topic that I want to cover is let's, let's, you know, we've talked about uh, electronics and we've talked about synthetic biology. Let's have a little bit of a nanotech smackdown and see how these two are going to stack up against each other in a particular application. And that application is energy. That's obviously one of the things that's most on everybody's mind, um, energy problems are, are going to be with us for quite some time. Can these new technologies help us? And so the question we're going to ask ourselves is, who's going to win, the chips or the bugs? And by that I mean, are we going to use solar panels to power ourselves in the future, or are we going to use um, biofuels created by algae or termites or whatever? I don't know. Now, I'm leaving out of this particular smackdown. We're not going to worry about... Uh, other sources of fuel. We're not going to worry about um, uh, fossil fuels. We're not going to worry about nuclear. We're just, just, this is just a question about, for these two, number one, does either of them have any kind of chance? And number two, which one looks better? Okay, that's our goal, is to think about that. And we're going to approach it like a physicist and try to get our hands upon the basic numbers and really keep as much confusion out of it as possible. So that's, uh, so how many of you think the chips are going to win? How many of you think the bugs are going to win? How many of you have no idea whether the chips or the bugs are going to win? <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, okay. Well, we'll see. Um, the first thing you should ask is, what's the nature of the problem? 
And to do that, let's talk a little bit about energy consumption. And we're going to take as our unit of energy consumption the 100-watt light bulb. Slightly outdated, but uh, still, still relevant at least for a few more months. Uh, the light bulb here, 100 watts, okay? So the question is, how much power does it take to run you? If instead of eating, you could plug yourself into the wall, how many light bulbs would you be? Would you be one, ten, or a hundred? Okay. So how many think you are one? How many think you are ten? How many think you are a hundred? How many of you have no idea? <laughs> we, won't, we won't bother with that. Uh, the answer is, the answer is, whoops, I didn't tell you what the answer was. The answer is one. You are one light bulb. And that, when I say you, I mean just your physical body. You consume about the same amount of power as a light bulb when it's on, um, and when you're on. Uh, that's telling you something. You're a pretty good machine compared to a light bulb. I'll put it that way. Um, it's really remarkable. And you can think about that. If it, let's say it were 100. Okay, you thought it was 100. Here's a thought experiment. Put 100 light bulbs in each one of these seats and light them all up. What's going to happen to this room? Easy bake oven, right? <laughs> it's not going to be good. Right, it's actually one. You're only one light bulb. That's pretty cool. How about to run your life? meaning to power the lights in this room, your computer, your car, everything that basically takes the U.S. energy consumption divided by the number of people in the country, how much power do you need? How many light bulbs do you have on all the time in your life, in a sense? And this is all, all forms of energy, not just electricity. Is it one, ten, or a hundred? Who thinks one? Who thinks ten? Who thinks a hundred? Yeah, it's a hundred. It's a hundred light bulbs. You have on 100 light bulbs, that many, all the time. That's, that's your life right there, 100 light bulbs. By the way, one of my colleagues at Harvard thought, oh, this would be cool, I'm going to build this demo. And so he put 100 light bulbs in and he got some power cords. And he plugged it in and, of course, immediately blew the circuit. Um, so they had to bring in power cords from all around the different other uh, uh, lecture halls in order to power it. And he said 100 light bulbs is really, really, really bright. Okay. <laughs> But that's what you've got on all the time. Every last moment of the day, you're burning 100 light bulbs. Okay? And that's why life is so good. That's why you live like a king or a queen, because you have 100 people working for you all the time, in some sense of the word. Sounds pretty good, as long as we can keep coming up with that energy. Okay? Now, in contrast, for example, this, I made this a couple of years ago, so it's probably not quite as true as it was then. China, for example, has about 10 light bulbs on per person. So they use, per person, about one-tenth what we do now. But they're coming up, and they're using more. And I mean, in that regard, actually, what the U.S. does doesn't matter so much as it does as an example for China. We better get it right before the Chinese come up to their 100 light bulbs, or we're all in a lot of trouble. Okay, moving on. Uh, could, you know, solar do it? Could you even possibly solve this problem? with solar energy? Um, well, the answer is, yeah, you could. It turns out that um, the practical potential for solar energy is about 600 terawatts, which is uh, a, a lot more than we currently use. So it's not physically impossible that you couldn't do it. And to put that in human scale, basically every person, everyone in this room, uh, if you had a solar panel, a meter on a side, that would take into account about two of your light bulbs that you would need if you had 100% efficiency. You don't, you have about 10%, so it gets bigger by a factor of 10, and then you need a lot more than that. So you would end up needing a piece of land about the size of your backyard for your particular solar cell, okay? Um, a key point in all this is what is the solar energy efficiencies? Um, so a silicon solar cell that you can buy off the shelf now is typically around a 10% efficiency, okay? Um, you can get 50% efficient solar cells, but you have to pay a huge amount of money. It's not economically relevant. This is a better number. Um, well, what about for the bugs? Well, photosynthesis in biology is something on the order of 5% efficient for converting sunlight into something useful. Um, if you want to actually extract that from the organism, it'll be a lot less than that unless you manage to make things much more efficient than current biology has done. 
And in fact, the most optimistic project projections for algae biofuels at the moment are 1 to 2 percent efficient, five times at least less than silicon. Corn to ethanol, by the way, about 0.1 percent efficient, and there may be a sign error in that. It may actually be negative. You use so much energy to make corn ethanol, it almost equals the amount of energy you get out. So it's a very, very tiny efficiency for corn ethanol. So here's the U.S. Let me show you a couple of squares. If you want to, if you want to make the U.S. Uh, energy independent by building solar cells, you have to cover that part of the country with solar cells. So that's, you know, looking not so good. <laughs> we have to cover a significant fraction of the, of, of the state of Oklahoma and Texas and Colorado and Kansas in order to do it. So at one level, this is depressing, meaning that's a lot of real estate. On the other level, it's not impossible. It's not bigger than the U.S., so, you know, it's, it's at least possible. And that's, this is for 10% efficient solar cells. This is a, a view graph I stole from Nate Lewis at Caltech. If you want to do it with algae biofuels, giving them the efficiency that I told you about before, you have to do that. So you have to cover this big plus sign with some sort of green goop uh, if you want to do it with algae biofuels. And by the way, this is to do everything. This is to meet all of our energy needs, not just our transportation fuels, but everything. Um, if you want to do it with corn ethanol, that's what you need. So, <laughs> so that's, uh, you know, that's the one. To, so you can certainly bet against corn ethanol. Um, but I also, my personal feeling is that silica, until your biofuels start to get their percentages up above 1% or 2%, it ain't going to happen. It's only going to be a niche product just because of the large uh, requirements for land use and water and what have you. Solar... It's really tough, but it's not incredibly impossible. And furthermore, where you would like to put solar cells are actually over here somewhere. You'd like to put them in dry places where you wouldn't want to put much of anything else. And so it doesn't compete for the same resources that uh, uh, crop or uh, uh, algae biofuels do. So I actually, my guess is I'm betting on silicon rather than on, on algae biofuels, which is unfortunately not nearly as cool. The technology for silicon is much more boring but I think it's more practical. But I should say others differ, including people high up at the Department of Energy, so you don't have to listen to me. So why don't we just do it? Why don't we just make cover you know, that part of the country in solar cells and be done with it? And the answer is it's strictly an economic problem now. If we wanted to do that, it typically cost about $5 per installed watt of power. It's going to take about 90 terabucks, which is equivalent of $300,000 for each and every one of you. So if you want to solar power your life, if you've got $300,000, go for it, okay? Otherwise, you've got to wait. And 90 terabucks, no matter how you slice it, is a lot of money. Uh, uh, the U.S. GDP is only 12 terabucks, so we'd all have to stop working for about eight years, do nothing but build solar panels for eight years, and be done with it. Um, the U.S. military budget is only about 0.4 terabucks. So you could close down the military and start building solar cells and at this kind of price, it ain't going to happen anytime soon. So it's a huge job to make this happen. Um, how, do you, how might you make some progress on this? Uh, the DOE goal is to bring that cost from $5 to $1 per watt. Um, whether we'll make it, I don't know, but we'll certainly get from $5 down to a couple dollars per watt, for sure. If we did make this factor of five, it goes from being $300,000 to $60,000, which, while a lot, is starting to be something that is at least comprehensible, especially if you do a few more things. So obviously you could use less. What if we could cut our energy use in half? In fact, that's about what Europe does. Europe uses about half the power that we do, and they live a pretty good life. Their houses are a little smaller, they're a little more tightly packed together, but, uh, and they have better public transit, and as a result, they use half the power that we do now. It would be fairly easy for us to get to this place with uh, straightforward technological innovation that's already out there. Okay? So we can do this. We can get to half the consumption that, you, that we are now if we wanted to. It's very doable. Um, beyond that, it starts to get a lot harder. But we could get another factor of two right there. Okay? And how do we do that? It's a lot of little things. A trivial example is a light bulb, which is only 5% efficient. 
and we're trying very hard to get rid of those um, and replace them by, in the future, it will probably be mostly LEDs, or could very well be, which can be 50% efficient. So there's a factor of 10 right there. So we could knock down lighting uh, use by a huge factor just by throwing a little bit more money up front and making uh, light bulbs in a, and, and lighting in a very different way. Um, the other great thing that happens, as you do more of this stuff, it gets cheaper. This is the cost of a module produced versus number produced. The more you build, the cheaper it gets. It's one of the laws of manufacturing. It just happens by sort of magic. The more you build, the cheaper it gets, unless you run out of raw materials. Okay. Silicon, we got as much of that as we could possibly want. Um, so the raw materials are probably okay. So we can hope and expect that things will keep getting cheaper the more we build. And so uh, if you can push yourself down this curve by building more, uh, you can hope that it's going to get cheaper and cheaper. So out of doing all that, um, you can go from the box that I had shown you before uh, to a box that looks something more like that. So that's with our cutting the demand in half and then increasing, say, the efficiency of a solar cell by making better technology. And it's still a big box, but it's getting you know, down to a level where you can imagine it happening. And the cost is getting to a number that is on the order of the GDP for one year rather than the GDP for a, a decade. So, you know, it's not going to happen instantaneously, but you can see a route to where the, these kinds of uh, technologies will start to have a real impact in our day-to-day -day life. Now, having said all that, one should be careful because things don't always go as you expect. And uh, to show you that, I'll just, you know, leave you with this uh, last little movie here of this frog who had its own idea of something fun to do. <laughs> yeah, I like that. that was for you, Jacqueline. Uh, <clears throat> um, so, you know, we can make changes like this. They're going to be complicated. There's going to be unforeseen things. But, you know, we can change a light bulb. We can do the, do the world different, do things differently. But it's going to take everybody, and it's going to require major changes in the way we do business in order to have a big impact. Um, but there's a quote that, that I like that sort of captures at least my perspective on this problem. And it's from a guy named Robert Strauss who said, it's a little like wrestling a gorilla. You don't quit when you are tired. You quit when the gorilla is tired. Uh, so with that, I will stop and be happy to take any questions that you have. To take the square root of any 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 number that has a, a an Basically. integer square root, right? Yeah, probably, yeah. Yeah. So there is a, you know, this computer computer technology is doing fantastically well, right? We have these incredible microprocessors. So for some bizarre human reason, whenever you invent a new technology, you think the thing to do is to try to take down <laughs> the best technology in the world, <laughs> silicon. For example, using DNA to try to do computation. And honestly, it's silly, right? I mean, this stuff is, don't, don't go after King Kong until you've had a few sparring matches first. Uh, so I think while that's really interesting and fun science, I think, uh, I know in my field, we're always under pressure to try to displace the silicon transistor. That's what our, the, our funders always want us to do. And we're like, you know, the silicon transistor is doing just fine, thank you. We need to be worrying about all these other issues where there aren't good technological solutions. Yes. It took you seven years to write your book, and there's 50 something chapters in the book. Right? <laughs> so, can you talk a little bit about that process? You would do research, and then would you knock out like three or four chapters? Or, how yeah, so <laughs> how does someone spend seven years writing a book with only 300 pages? Is your question? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's seven days a page, basically. Um, the answer is you don't write one book, you write 15 books. So, I wrote the book. <laughs> Rewrote it, rewrote it, rewrote it. They say that you have to write a million words before you're ready as a writer. And that means something on the order of, of 10 books. And I just chose to write the same book 10 times rather than to write 10 different books. Um, 
But people who read like early versions, uh, you know, what the, the, a couple of the characters have the same names. And there are little microbots in it, but almost everything else is completely different. So for me, it was my basically undergraduate and graduate education in writing, just rewriting that book over and over again. And honestly, had I taken a course early on, I could have saved myself a couple of years probably. Uh, having said that, you learn a lot by making mistakes. Um, and so I, I, many of you probably know that. Sometimes you don't go to class and you have to work harder to catch up. But you learn more than if the teacher just flows it into you in this nice, clean, packaged way. So for me, flailing around and learning how to do stuff on my own was part of the learning experience. And so that's what took so long. Uh, I kept writing different versions. And your next book is along the same lines? So the, the next book is not a sequel, but will be also a scientific thriller. Um, the other thing, by the way, that sort of set me free to write a book was I was scared to death to try to write the great American novel. You know, I didn't want to be Nabokov. Well, maybe I did, but I knew I couldn't be. But suddenly the idea that I could cheat and use all my, my day knowledge from science to write a thriller, then I felt like I had an upper hand and I had something to offer that, that all the MFA students in the country did not have to offer. Um, so I'm stuck with, and I also love to read, you should also, uh, it's really great to, to write what you like to read, and I do very much enjoy reading a well-crafted thriller. So as a football one, you say your job is to read thrillers? Yes. Uh, yeah, that's a, I, I should have come with a, a good list. Let me think of something that I read recently. I read, um, this, isn't, this isn't great literature at all, but it's really fascinating. There's a book called Demon by Daniel Suarez. Anybody read Demon? Nobody's read Demon? Wow. Kids, what are you doing these days? Um, uh, it's been read by a lot of uh, higher-ups in Washington, um, and it's about... It's basically about the takeover of our world by, we're basically all going to be playing in a multiplayer video game soon. That's basically the, the, the gist of it. Um, that our world and uh, a sort of a, you know, you're going to have, in 10 years from now when I'm giving this talk, there will be balloons over all of your heads telling me what your names are and what your majors are and what kind of, what your favorite color is, you know, something like that. Um, and when you're texting, I'll be able to see what you're texting is if I've got the right software. S-U-A-R-E-Z, Suarez. Um, so uh, if you're looking for just, you know, brilliantly written scientific thrillers or, or, or thrillers that are sort of models for the writing, for the kind of writing that I like, um, so I think uh, Jurassic Park by Michael Crichton is obviously a classic. Um, Silence of the Lambs by uh, Harris is, is one of the best thrillers I've ever read. It's really, really fascinating. And there's a guy named Michael Gruber, who I think is just amazingly smart and interesting. Uh, and Tropic of Night, his first book, I, is, I think, pretty amazing. Yes? Um, I like the presentation. I want to be money for it. And uh, I just want to comment on the top questions you did for each uh, paper you want to take on the rest of the industry. And uh, I think that needs to be improved here in America because um, I'm from Portugal. And, uh, right now, the country produces 50% from renewable sources. And the government plays an important role there because all the citizens uh, had the opportunity to invest in the selling electricity to the network. And I think that would be a great idea to see them here in America because people would be more motivated and we could save um, the world with the pollution and increase that. Yep. But I like that. Yeah. And I, I have to s I, I thank you. And, and I have to say that I think what's something that's very important for all of us to do as citizens, for particularly as you as scientists and engineers, is to come up with a simple way of expressing the scientific part of it so that people can't hide, and that they can't say, oh, no, corn ethanol is great. It's not great. It doesn't make any sense. And you need to be able to show that in a simple way as possible so that we don't waste our resources on it. I mean, you may want to do it for other reasons, to subsidize the farm industry. That's fine. But if you think you're solving the energy crisis, you're not. And again, with the, with the silicon versus biofuels, if you want to take the biofuels argument, you've got, to, you've got to deal with the fact that your percentage is low and you have to have a reason why that's going to work. And if I express things in, in gallons per hectare and all sorts of weird units that nobody understands, I can confuse you and keep you so off balance that you don't know what I'm talking about. 
And it's very important to find very simple things to express these ideas. And then the great thing about it is then you can remember them. If you remember something from this talk, it'll probably be that you are a light bulb and that, uh, and that you, your world is a hundred light bulbs. Everybody can remember that. Um, and I, I, that's how I think about it now. And then once you think about it that way, it's harder for people to confuse you. Yes? And poems and Roald Hoffman, yes, yes. And so uh, that sort of follows the thing. And my question is then, when you do any consulting or uh, reading any sort of work, um, so the question was, uh, so first off, yeah, another great example of, of people who live at that boundary. Cornell seems to collect them. Um, do I do any consulting for television or movies? I haven't. I've, I've looked into that a little bit. They really, you need to live in L.A to a first approximation, um, they prefer that because then they, they want you to come out and do stuff. So I know, I have friends at Caltech, for example, that do that. Um, so then it, 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 it's easier to do. Um, I could probably, you could do some of it remotely. In fact, they're trying to, to make some programs that help connect up scientists to writers. Um, and it, that might be fun. Um, but I have to admit, once you start writing a whole thing yourself, you then kind of want to write the whole piece yourself and not just feed somebody else other information. Uh, but I think programs that do that, that start to link up the scientific and artistic communities are fantastic. And for example, this movie that I showed of, of the workings of biology, you know, that didn't cost very much money. And I think that those kinds of things can do more to help infuse in people a sense of the wonder of science than almost anything else you can think of. And so I really love the idea of taking uh, art and science and technology and mixing them. And by the way, if you like that kind of thing, you should read the new biography of Steve Jobs. And that was basically his principle in life, was to build things at the intersection of technology and the arts. And it's a fantastic read, so I encourage you to read that as well. One more question. On a scale of one to ten, what do you think the chances are that your book will be a movie? Will be a movie. So the good news is the book was optioned to be made into a movie. The bad news is for every... Um, option, uh, only one out of a hundred turns into a movie. Um, actually, where mine is at, I think it's probably made it to one in ten because we wrote a screenplay and they're shipping it around. But it's still, the odds are, are small but finite, but better than they were if I hadn't optioned it. And it's been a great fun to see how that process works. So I think for me that's been the most interesting part, to be able to meet some of the people in that world and understand how they, how they look at things. But they have this incredible pyramid of the stuff that they acquire versus uh, what they um, actually make a movie out of. And so for a $100 million movie, they will spend $100 million on other projects that they never develop. 